Good afternoon. My name is JJ Spoon and I'm Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for European Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to this month's Conversation on Europe, which is the launch of our Year of Creating Europe series and focuses on the Europe, European Union's motto, United in Diversity, and what Europe is, what it is, what Europe is, what it was, and what it can be. Like most events this fall, this conversation is being conducted entirely virtually, and we will be recording the session and know that no other panelists other than those that uh, are visible to you, or excuse me, no other participants other than the panelists will be visible or, or audible. And so any questions that you may have today, um, and we do encourage, uh, encourage questions, please put them in the chat. Um, at any point uh, as you're listening, uh, feel free to put them in there and we will um, get to the, as many as we can during the course of today's discussion. Today's conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center and the University Center for, of International Studies at Pittsburgh and is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Our co-sponsors today are the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Florida International University, the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. To learn more about our future conversations on Europe and programming we are doing with other EU funded institutions in the US through our hashtag JM in the USA initiative, please visit our website and I'll have one of my colleagues put that in the chat um, so that you have that. Um, I want to thank my colleagues Iris Mtievich and Alison Delnor for their help in organizing today's event. On May 9, 1950, French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman introduced the Schuman Declaration, which proposed the creation of the European Coal and Steel Commission made up of France, West Germany, Belgium, Italy, <laughs> Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. The ECSC would ultimately become the European Union. In the declaration, Schuman stated, quote, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity, unquote. This solidarity would drive the development of the EU's motto nearly 50 years later, united in diversity. The 70th anniversary of the Schuman Declaration provides us with the opportunity to explore the political, social, cultural, geographical forces that have given shape to contemporary Europe and also the individuals who create and are creative in their daily or artistic expressions of what it means to be European. Today's roundtable discussion is the kickoff of our year of creating Europe, as I mentioned before, in which we will explore these and other questions. Today, uh, I am joined by four experts um, in our, in our, that will join me in our discussion um, of, of these, these questions. Um, I am pleased to welcome first Andrula Vestilio, who was the European Commissioner for Education, Culture, Multilingualism, and Youth from 2010 to 2014 during the Barroso presidency. Among other positions she has held, uh, Mrs. Vasilio was the First Lady of Cyprus from 1988 to 1993. She served as a member of the Cyprus House of Representatives, was Vice President of the European Liberal Party and Chair of the European Liberal Women's Network. Today, uh, she is currently the Vice President of Europa Nostra, a pan-European federation for cultural heritage, representing citizens organizations that work to safeguard Europe's cultural and natural heritage. Next, I am joined by Johan Fornes, who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Media and Communication Studies in the School of Culture and Education at Södertörn yes. University in Sweden. His research deals with issues of media culture and cultural mediation, intermedial interplays between cultural genres and media forms, and intersectional interplays between identity dimensions. His interdisciplinary cultural research is based on hermeneutic interpretation, discourse analysis, and media ethnography. Among other publications, Dr. Fornace is the author of Defending Culture, Conceptual Foundations, and Contemporary Debates, and Signifying Europe. Next, I'm joined by Susanna Eckersley, who is Senior Lecturer in Media, Culture, Heritage Studies at Newcastle University in the UK, where she specializes in museum, gallery, and heritage studies. She's the lead co-editor of the Rutledge book series, Critical Heritages of Europe, and is the project leader of and counterpoints, renegotiating belonging through culture and contact in public space and place, which is funded by the humanities in the European research area. Most recently, Dr. Eckersley is the co-author of Dimensions of Heritage and Memory, Multiple Europes and the Politics of Crisis, published by Rutledge in 2020. And last, but of course not least, I am joined by Michal Friedman, who is Assistant Teaching Professor and the Jack Buncher Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies in the Department of History at Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh. She specializes in Jewish diasporic history, 
especially that of Sephardi and Spanish-speaking Jewish communities, and in Spanish history and culture. She is currently working on a book manuscript titled Recovering Jewish Spain, Politics, Historiography, and Institutionalization of the Jewish Past in Spain, 1845 to 1935. Most recently, Dr. Friedman has established a multifaceted collaboration with the Centropa Archive, which is a digitized collection of 1,200 interviews and 20,000 photographs of Jews who remained in Eastern and Central Europe, Russia, and the Balkans after surviving the Holocaust. So welcome to all of you, and, and I look forward to our discussion today. I'd like to start by discussing the EU's official position on diversity and its motto, United in Diversity which I mentioned before, and how and why it makes policies in line with that position. Uh, and Rula, I think we can start with you on this. Thank you. Well, you mentioned the motto, United in Diversity. Uh, this motto was adopted by the Union uh, back in 2000. And uh, this uh, shows how the Europeans come together in order to work for peace and prosperity, but at the same time being enriched by the continent's many different languages, traditions, and cultures, and, and uh, uh, religions as well. So I think united in diversity is very, very important uh, motto, and um, this prompted the European Union, and especially the uh, uh, portfolio or the services which I presided over for five years, in order to adopt policies and programs which serve this motto. For example, multilingualism. Um, can you imagine the representatives of 27 nations meeting at the European Parliament under one language? It would be impossible. And it would not be fair. And we wouldn't have the same type of uh, discussions as we have today, because now we have 24 official languages. I say 24 because less than the member states, because some member states share the same language, like Austria and Germany, for example. Now, uh, but at the same time, the European Union supports and protects hundreds of other minority languages, which are not official languages of the Union, but they are minority languages spoken by many different groups who are European citizens. Now, um, the, some people say, but why does the Union spend so much money in translation and interpretation in the 24 languages? But this is very important. I mean, how do we expect the politicians, the national politicians, or even the citizens, to know what it is decided in, in Brussels without having it in their own language. So all the important legal documents and other, of course, important documents are translated in the 24 official languages. Of course, we have working languages. Uh, for example, in the European Commission where I worked, we had uh, only three working languages, English, French, and German. But otherwise, everything is translated in, uh, in the 24 languages. So this is very important. The other, the other thing is the cultural program. You mentioned Creative Europe program, which was uh, uh, adopted uh, when I was um, commissioner, and under which we have many different sub-programs which show exactly the eagerness of the union and the intention of the union to promote diversity and protect diversity. Let's take, for example, the uh, European Literary Prize. This is given every three years to a national uh, writer who has excelled in his writing. And at the same time, the union supports the expenditure of translating these books in different languages so that every citizen of the European Union who is interested in literacy, in, in literary, then uh, uh, can read it in their own language and understand the mentality of the people, of the writer, 
the, the, the way of life, etc. So this is also very, very important. But uh, I could mention many, many others. For example, the media, pro the media program. Uh, if you ask anybody involved in the media, the audiovisual uh, in England, in the UK, I, I think most of them, if not all of them, were against Brexit. Why? Because they get really millions of euros in support of their audiovisual work in their films, the filmmaking. And it's so important to give European films precedence vis-a-vis -vis other films. Because they represent these films, they represent values and principles which form the basis of the European Union. So I could go on and on, but maybe during the discussion we can elaborate more on other programs as well. No, absolutely. Thank you very much. And we have had, um, you mentioned the EU Prize for Literature. We've actually had two of the former winners um, on campus in the past couple of years. Um, which yes. has been which has been which has been great, and they've really, they've uh, not only spoken about their 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 books, but met with students, met with students on Pitt's campus, as well as high school students, talking about the writing process, talk, you know, bringing that experience, which has been you know really great from a from a cultural ambassador uh, perspective. I don't I don't know how many of you uh, or of your audience have uh, followed the State of the Union address of uh, our president uh, Ursula von der Leyen yesterday. It was her first State of the Union address. And I was so pleased that she started by mentioning a very important European, the late John Hume from Ireland, who was really uh, one of the greatest politician, Irish politician, and who passed away a few uh, months ago. He said, addressing the European Parliament in 98, the European visionaries decided that difference is not a threat. Difference is natural. Difference is the essence of humanity. And this is exactly, it, it's the nutshell or the synopsis of what is meant united in uh, um, diversity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm very, thank you very much for bringing, for mentioning that. I was, uh, I was going to bring that up at some point in the conversation, but I think that that's, uh, you know, really a very important point in terms of talking about um, the, the, uh, you know, the importance of diversity and really thinking about what, you know, what, when we think about what Europe is. Um, and I think that that's really important to, to keep that in mind, of course. Um, Johan, I wanted to turn to you um, and talk perhaps a little bit about some of the things that Andrula mentioned um, when we talk about literature, when we talk about film, language, all of these things, and how those things relate to this idea of signaling, you know, what Europe is and some of these bigger questions um, and in some of the work that, that you've done as well. Yes, I think it's, it may, it's very useful at least to have a look at the different symbols that are used, uh, become used to identify Europe or the European project, unification project. I mean, uh, because they, uh, the, the motto, United in Diversity, which was installed in the year 2000, as um, Andrula said. Uh, also, it, um, it, it's only one of the five big symbols that have been officially uh, recognized in uh, the 2004 draft treaty con for constituting Europe. Um, uh, the other ones, I, I, it's striking that most people don't know so many of them, but, but of course everyone knows the flag, the European flag, which was already uh, invented or designed by the Council of Europe in 1955, so it's the oldest one. And then came the anthem some years after, uh, the Europe Day, which is the 9th of May, uh, the motto, and finally the currency, because the euro money has also been described as a symbol for Europe. All of them were invented in space and installed in different periods because of specific needs and they in a way they respond to each other there are some homologies between them they they are similar in some ways they say it's partly the same thing but they do it in different ways and there are often um, quite diverse also uh, for instance i think that the 
the motto, which is so important for the European Cooperation Project, uh, United in Diversity, it must be also linked back to the flag, because the flag with the, with the, with the 12 uh, yellow stars in a cer perfect circle, it seems to signify very much uh, um, united in unity, because every star is similar to each other. And that's a point with it also, that there should, should be equality among the member states and the citizens of Europe. So they should be equal. Not, no, not any, not, no one should be bigger than the other, so to speak. More, it's not like the Chinese flag, which has a one big star for the Communist Party and the four smaller stars for the different regions. So uh, for Europe, they must be similar. But if they are similar as they are, they don't really express the diversity side of the European project. There is no represent, representation of that. Uh, so instead, um, for instance, the gay movement, they have made a variant of this flag with the rainbow colors of, in, the flag, in the stars. Uh, so that each star is different, but still the same size and the same distance from the center as well, which is also an important issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but also the EU, uh, roughly similar, at the same time as uh, the motto was invented, they also um, hired a, a Dutch designer, an artist, an architect, Rem Kolas, to de design the so-called barcode, which is like um, every, the colors from all national flags of European states uh, have been added to each other in as vertical stripes, forming a beautiful um, image, but uh, really, it really expresses united in diversity, you would say, because it's the diversity that may, if, if every flag had had the same colors, it would have been a very boring flag because then it <laughs> only had one color. But here it's the multicolor thing that is expressed. It hasn't been used so very much, but it exists as a, in parallel to the ordinary European flag. Now, the European motto, um, the European uh, authorities and European activists, they stress very much that it is, uh, it, uh, well, I should say first that this motto was decided by a competition held in uh, different papers, journals, magazines in, in uh, Europe, where school children could vote for different proposals and invent them. And finally, they landed in United in Diversity. Actually, the vote ended with the, the formulation unity in difference because that was what they used. Uh, but then they changed, they, the bureaucrats within the EU are basically, I think, they decided to modify it a little bit. So it was united in diversity instead of unite, unity in difference. I think unity in difference sounds too finished. It's like it's already done and you just describe uh, something static, but united in diversity there, you can feel that it's, it's a process of unification going on all the time. And uh, the, the, the many different uh, languages and different cultures, different film cultures, for instance, that exist all over Europe, that has been seen for a long time as a, uh, an obstacle to unification. Because if you are so different, how can we share something in common. There have been efforts, for instance, to start a European journal or European TV channels and so on. But it doesn't work because we don't have, we don't want to see the same things and, and we don't uh, have the same language even, um, most of us. So um, um, th this was difficult. And then one could say that this motto is a symbol that manages to make of this obstacle to make it a resource instead, to redefine this diversity from being a hindrance to unification, to be actually a mot mot motif uh, of unifying. Because uh, it's precisely because we are different that we can become a strong uni unity, so to speak. That's what they want to stress. So, um, um, and they, they often compare it with the American motto that existed uh, earlier uh, and exists, still exists, I think, on the dollar. <laughs> coins, e um, pluribus unum, it says, it's, it's Latin and means uh, from many one. So from many we are one now. This expresses a kind of a melting pot uh, idea of, of identity where different uh, people come together in the United States of America and they 
they were many before, but now they are one because they, they have one language, one culture in common and so on. That's a, a, at least what that motto, the American motto, seems to uh, imply. Uh, instead, the EU and the Europeans who work with this, they wanted not that kind of melting pot idea. They instead voted for this salad bowl <laughs> metaphor. And if you mix lettuce, tomatoes, and cucumber in in a in a bowl, then you you get really not as and you don't use a mixer, so it doesn't become a smoothie. <laughs> but then each ingredient can be distinguished, but still they form a tasty totality. You could say, you can pick out the tomatoes if you don't like them, but uh, they are they are there and they become good together. Maybe the real process is somewhere in between because. I would call it a fish soup, perhaps, <laughs> because in the fish <laughs> soup, uh, you can still pick out maybe the fish parts, but many of the spices and so on, they have become a mixture that which is not possible to separate again. Um, so I think this, um, so the motto added something to the palette of the five, of the four earlier European symbols that the flag, for instance, couldn't manage, namely, the, expressing the, the positive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis irreducible diversity as a kind of creative resource. Uh, thank yeah, you. A short introduction. You, made, thank you very much. You've made me hungry. It is lunchtime here, so <laughs> I'm thinking about soup and about salad. But th no, I thank you for bringing up those various ways of thinking about sort of from many what results from that and i think that that's something that we you know is very salient of course in in the us today as we as we um uh discuss and debate um all sorts of all sorts of issues but i think this idea of the the salad or the <laughs> the fish soup right that it is you know recognizing difference right and i think that that the the point that you made as well that that the eu chose not to be unity in difference mm -hmm. right but and that that seems like a fait accompli, that that is finished and that it is not, you know, a, 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 you know, a dynamic and growing and change and ever changing, right? As the, as the, you know, as the, as Europe changes, as the populations change, the demographics change, sort of recognizing. And I think that that, you know, that point that, that united in diversity kind of opens the box for that as well, that it is what Europe looked like in 1960 is very different than what it looks like today. Um, and what it will look like, right? I think that's the other that, that's the important that's the other important point. I want to get back to something that you mentioned um, as well, and 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 to to hear what some of you your thoughts may be on this, you or or others, which is you know have some of these symbols and these ideas of Europe in within sort of this motto that we've talked about, or some of these other symbols that clearly have meaning and uh, in terms of what they are, have they been challenged by different groups within within Europe. You mentioned the LGBTQ community, right? Making their own flag with the stars, with the, you know, mm. adding rainbows to the stars to, you know, I think sort of say, hey, we're here and we want to have our identity recognized. And I wonder if there are other examples where we're seeing some of this, uh, these ideas of from that are coming from from the European Union itself being challenged by different groups in different across Europe from a religious perspective a cultural perspective that you know individuals are not seeing themselves their group their identity in these symbols and in these in these mottos that in the motto and other things I may I sure please uh, there are uh, certainly such examples um, but I can also mention that uh, in the process where they decided of, of the flag, there was a proposal from many pan-European movements to instead have the cross, a blue flag with a yellow cross in the middle. And that was uh, much uh, critique against uh, is in the U Council of Europe, where also, for instance, Turkey is a member. So, of course, a, a Muslim Islam country cannot accept that Europe should be de de defined by Christian symbol mm -hmm. as the cross. But um, uh, even the star circle has been sometimes hinted at, I've seen in some notes that it also has a Christian inspiration because it, it maybe the designer was inspired by the halo again around mm -hmm. the, the head of the saints in mm -hmm. Christian churches. Now, I'm not, I haven't studied that so carefully. Maybe they are, there are stars around the Muslim 
uh, authorities or Christian and Muslim religious uh, figures as well. I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I think uh, that has, I've seen some, maybe not central, but some uh, questioning <laughs> of uh, that there might be a Catholic sort of spell around uh, the, the EU because it's chosen that symbol. But um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe others know more about this. Yeah, if anyone else wants to, well, I can also say. For, well, maybe after that, also that uh, I've seen an, in my book, um, my book, signifying Europe. <laughs> uh, I have uh, analyzed several um, different artworks. There are artists of various kinds who have made critical parodies, so to speak, of this star circle. They have added. Um, swastikas instead of stars or uh, communist uh, symbols instead of them um, but I, I don't think any of those have been really efficient or really made problem managed to problematize mm -hmm. the star circle as it is mm -hmm. there are more interesting examples that more develop the star circle some for instance have done uh, the uh, uh, have made taken the map of europe and made every capital city a star so that becomes quite a not a circle anymore but a, a map of europe through through the capitals as stars mm -hmm. this is something you can think of mm -hmm. but it's not I a think, critique I think, uh, if, yeah, I, if, I, if i may say uh, the fact that uh, different groups have their own flag doesn't mean necessarily that they challenge the flag of the european union uh, i i take it that it is uh, their way of uh, saying to the European Union, don't forget about us, we are part of you. We mm -hmm. want to be acknowledged and we want our rights to be acknowledged because the same goes for the ecologists, for the environmentalists, it goes for the people who are in favor of uh, uh, gender equality, uh, it goes for the cultural world because now we have the, the, the European Alliance of Culture, uh, where uh, 50 different uh, organizations, which are uh, great proponents of culture and cultural heritage, they have their own flag, but it doesn't mean that they challenge the flag of the Union. They recognize the flag, but in addition, they want to say, hey, we are here. And I was pleased, and I think, uh, uh, you will say, uh, uh, affirm this, that uh, our president yesterday referred specifically to the rights of the, uh, of these people. And, this, and she said, uh, yes, and uh, she said that uh, we are all equal and we shall strive for equality of all the groups, which Very was perfect. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that I think that's a really sort of powerful statement to say that groups are taking the, the, the symbols of Europe, the flag, for example, Oops. the 12 stars and, and taking it and saying this is a, this is we are part of this, but we yes. also want to use this to recognize who we are. And so, as you, as you said, I like the don't forget about us. That we're, we're this is part, part of, of the diversity. This is mm -hmm. part of the diversity. It consists, I mean, the European Union consists of so many different groups. And we acknowledge the, the, their mm -hmm. existence and their work because they all contribute to the mm -hmm. unity of the European Union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Johan, yes. Yeah, I think also uh, one other, I think one thing is interesting with the, with the flag, uh, the, the circle has been, uh, a Dutch, another Dutch artist once made a, a satirical image where he, he uh, made this star circle into a full circle uh, not the stars anymore, but just a yellow circle. And he thought that could signify the emptiness of the European project. Mm -hmm. That's a very, uh, and, uh, and also it could make, you could make this sign, then you showed this, it was a, with your hands you can make the circle, but that was a joke, it was a, f a humoristic critique of the mm -hmm. EU project. I think he was wrong because um, it's important that this dark circle is not quite closed, it's open, there is a space between each star which, through which you can pass in and out, so to speak. And I was once at a, at a Turkish in Istanbul conference on European identity and media, where the organizers, they have had uh, taken the star circle and put the Turkish flag uh, 
uh, moon and star in the center of the flag. And this, I think, was a very good idea of how you could think of the flag. You, could, you need not see it as a closed fortress, Europe, but rather as an open agora or a, a, a square or a public space where different actors can move in and out and do things together. That, that's a much more positive way of thinking of it, of this the star circle. So I think it has not been um, uh, made uh, irrelevant by the motto, for instance, but uh, the motto uh, stresses one aspect which the flag hid away a little bit, the diversity, the importance of diversity. And that is, I think that's the most successful of the five um, um, symbols. Also, I think the Euro currency is also important because the design of the of the f banknotes and the, also the coins uh, also show bridges, windows and so on, which other uh, national uh, currencies never show. And they are uh, vehicles for communication, which is an important thing that Europe mm -hmm. stresses. I also like that. So there are many good things in these symbols, whereas other other symbols haven't really worked so well. The Europe Day, for instance, very few people, I think, in m many countries in Northern and Western Europe, at least, know this day or, or care very much about it. So maybe mm -hmm. the, the day is not so successful. Yeah, no, I think you've um, uh, brought up uh, all sorts of interesting points and, and something we may have time to get back to. I want to bring in our other panelists um, into this conversation, but something maybe we'll get back to if we have time is sort of how legible some of these uh, symbols are to those outside of the of the, the you know the of the European Union itself, and I think your point about Europe Day only being sort of recognized by you know certain individuals in certain countries I think is important, and I think this gets to a challenge that we all know that the EU has had since its inception, which is this democratic deficit, right? I mean, obviously I'm a political scientist, so I think a lot about, you know, from the voting perspective, but just from this perspective of creating Europeans and European identity and, you know, again, this sort of top-down nature of the EU and then the question of how much is, of that is heard from by, by those um, living in the countries. But I want to bring in Susanna and Michal. Susanna uh, first, I saw your hand, and then Michal uh, into the conversation. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just kind of comment on something. Um, it was really interesting hearing the very kind of hopeful and positive and forward-looking um, connections to the symbolism that uh, Johan and Andrula um, raised earlier. But in relation to the, the idea of united in diversity, I suppose I just wanted to raise the point of, of how um, that in itself has been um, the and you know has been criticized and criticized not only from the right wing but also from the left wing um, and i think that's a particularly interesting thing when the same the same issue is being criticized by by opposing sides on the political spectrum um, you know to think about from from perhaps from the left wing perspective the criticism or one of the criticisms of the eu's idea of diversity is that it is not diverse enough and doesn't recognize the the diversity not only within the nations of the eu but across europe uh, particularly in relation to the history and past of um, Europe um, and many European nations as colonizing states um, and how that relates to the populations, historic populations, but also contemporary populations and issues such as migration um, within Europe and Europe's countries today. Um, and I think it's, you know, one of the criticisms that came up very recently was also um, around the, the original name for one of Ursula von der Leyen's um, commissioners being around the idea of protecting European, um, the European way of life, which was then changed to promoting the European way of life, which I have to say I also find problematic, but the first, the first naming was, was very, very problematic for all sorts of reasons. Um, but then also to, to raise the, the issue that this idea of un united in diversity is also um, criticised from, from the right wing, um, you know, both the sort of conservative right, but also the far right, um, for being partly for being too diverse and not um, not seeing it um, Europe along their kind of ethnocentric lines as being um, an ethnic community based in their perspective on um, white um, European idea of um, that kind of ethnic heritage and I think it's interesting to see how they are also adopting some of the terminology and symbols that the European Union and um, European mechanisms are using 
for example, the identitarian movement in, in Germany and Austria um, have been using the, term, the, um, the name Europa Nostra for their own festivals of um, exclusive and um, radical far-right um, festivals of, of identity and belonging in a, in a, you know, in a very, obviously very divisive way, um, which is in complete opposition to the, the EU's idea of what Europa Nostra or, or the European identity is, it should be about. Um, can, I, can I interrupt in that? Sure. Because yes. I am a vice president of Europa Nostra, and yes. we know about this problem, but we took them to, to the court in Germany, and we succeeded. So they stopped using Europa Nostra for their ultra-right uh, purposes. Yes, thank you. So I think, I think that, the, that the point that Susanna made and, and, and is important, which is that this idea of, of Europe can be used in different ways. Right, and this idea of unity and diversity, as we know, can be taken by different groups that have different, have a very different agenda, and want to do something very different with that. And I think that that sort of goes back to the question of, of really, and or just the, the the idea of then how are these ideas and these concepts read by the population, right? If both the EU is using a, you know a set of a, a terminology as a way of building unity. And then we have the, the far right using it as a way of obviously, well, building their own unity, but, all, but also more generally, you know, sort of, you know, separating people. Um, and so I think that makes some of this very complicated because to the average person listening to this in terms of what is, what is the meaning of, the, of these various things, because different groups, as, as Susanna mentioned, are taking these, these on for themselves. Uh, Michal, drop, join into the conversation. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and um, I was sort of struck by in listening to the discussion of the insignia and, this, and the symbols uh, and how they're sort of from the moment they're created and then they're, how they're used by different populations. Um, something that, uh, that I, uh, I think about that I was thinking about was uh, what, given it is basically sort of a, a top down sort of process and then right, you have different sort of publics uh, within Europe engaging with these symbols. Uh, to what, how do these, um, these symbols and state sort of initiatives, um, we can talk about other state initiatives as well at the European level, um, translate to the living experiences of the different populations in Europe. Uh, and uh, and if we're speaking of diversity, if we talk about uh, populations that have been sort of historically sort of others in Europe, uh, to what extent uh, are the, sort of the, the uh, again, state sort of level initials at the European level or let's say national context, um, are they sort of, you know, trying to sort of reimagine different populations, reincorporating them or excluding them? Uh, so that's something I think about and I, um, if I can jump in, because I know uh, it, about the case of uh, Spain is an interesting uh, case, for instance, uh, where we have uh, a nationality law, a new law passed in 2015, uh, which um, basically allows um, Jews who are expelled, the ancestors of Jews who are expelled uh, over 500 years ago in 1492 uh, to um, basically apply for an expedited uh, sort of path to citizenship. In the cases in Portugal as well, there's a similar law, and it's, it's, it's different a bit than right, similar laws we have of sort of repatriation in Germany or Austria because it's a much longer sort of process uh, and ties into uh, sort of other issues in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and uh, so, so you have uh, this sort of nationality law that uh, again, you have uh, tens of thousands of applicants, uh, Jews from all over the world. Um, and at the same time, and you have other efforts uh, in Spain or let's say in Poland or other cases to sort of reincorporate, let's say uh, Jewish populations and Jewish heritage into uh, the national sort of heritage patrimony. But at the same time, um, so which, which creates, and, and also Muslims as well, which I'll talk about because the law, it's, that law in particular actually excludes Muslims. So uh, I can talk a little bit, a little bit more about uh, Jewish Muslim, Muslim relations, but uh, at the same time, uh, there's some sort of limitations these sort of top-down uh, sort of uh, efforts uh, and then not really engaging, uh, incorporating the living sort of uh, Jews into the nation, uh, even though it's a, it's a law actually allows them to become citizens, but on a sort of, in terms of sort of cultural efforts, 
uh, a lot of many times um, these efforts, as in the, the, the networks of, let's say, Jewish quarters, which is, uh, you have that throughout Europe, but also in Spain in particular, it's quite strong. Um, don't necessarily, again, engage, let's say, a wider sort of, sort of public, Jewish publics, uh, Muslim publics, uh, Spanish publics, other European publics, into really getting to uh, become more familiar with those cultures, that they stay at a superficial uh, level. So. No, thank you for, um, I think that's a really, uh, really important point to think about sort of this, you know, the, the supranational efforts of the EU and then what's happening obviously now, you know, in, in the 27 member states and, and how those either agree with each other or perhaps, you know, not disagree, but perhaps as, you, as, as you're saying, don't necessarily complete that full kind of idea, the ideal at the supranational level. So in some ways you have kind of the ideal and then in practice and the, the, the disconnect or the challenge in some ways of, of realizing this kind of broad kind of ideal that we're seeing from the EU. And so I think that's, I think that's a really important point. And I think the case that you mentioned in Spain and the, and the sort of re, repatriation, re-citizenship of, of those that were, of those that were expelled, I think really, you know, is a really interesting point in how, um, and, and what that means for, you know, sort of Spanish identity and what's happening in the nation state itself and how that either works with or isn't, you know, kind of not quite there in terms of what the EU um, is, is, uh, ha has in its, in its, in its motto. Johan, you want to add into that? Oh, you're muted if you want to. Just unmute yourself there. About that, yeah. Thank you. I I agree very much with Susanna's and Michelle's uh, points also. And I I'm sorry if I sounded too positive to to the EU uh, program. What I think what I am positive to is the the formulation of the EU diversity motto, so to speak. But the realization of it it's another matter. Uh, I think that now again and again you can see both how. Uh, in religious term, how Christianity is seen by many as a hidden norm of Europe, but also whiteness, uh, the European body is again and again uh, automatically seen as a white body, I would say. It, it's a hidden norm that turns up again and again. Uh, for instance, um, I, I, yes, I came over such uh, an interesting example. There was something when when um, when the euro was installed in 2002, there, the EU also commissioned uh, someone to make a, a comic strip series, which you can find on the internet. It's uh, Captain Euro. It's he's called Captain Euro, <laughs> copied after Captain America, which is another superhero. <laughs> but this Captain Euro, he is um, of course very very white, <laughs> and that's him yeah. and his. And not, and also his his main opponent is uh, someone called Diver, D, Dr. Diverius or Divider, the Divider, and he is depicted as uh, he's a financier, so he is a finance capitalist. But he's also uh, head, his team has a traveling circus, so that he stands for mobility, whereas Captain Euro stands for Fortress Europe, you might say. He has a, a castle where they reside. So I think this goes very much against uh, other uh, European ideals for uh, mobility and for uh, diversity. But it, uh, this was something that was commissioned to, for children to understand the, the value of <laughs> European money. And I think this, uh, it's scaring that it, turns, it so easily returns such um, biases, which are so, of course, embedded in the power structures in the European institutions as well. And this reminds us, I think, that we must not uh, see these ideals as fulfilled. Uh, that's easy. It's easy to think that it's a part of European identity to be diverse and to be uh, tolerant, so to speak, to the others. Or, but we, can, we should rather see it as a task or a, it's something we, we have some competences in that through our history. We have learned translation in many ways. So, and we should use that in a responsible way to, to change not only the world around us, but also ourselves. And that's something we should never forget. And Thank you, Andrula. Yes. Um, Although this motto, uh, United in Diversity, uh, can very well work in the field of culture and in the field of uh, uh, 
uh, education to a certain extent through the various programs that we are uh, promoting. Uh, because, um, for example, our program is, as you say, sponsored by uh, Erasmus Plus program, uh, which I feel like uh, is um, part of my uh, family. <laughs> yes, um, because it helps Europeans or nationals of one country really feel European by visiting other countries and by getting to know the different cultures, the different languages, uh, getting on, on uh, their own, they become more Europeans. But let's not forget that this motto does not work very well when politics are coming into, into power, uh, when their national interests are uh, involved, when decisions involve um, a rule of law, uh, economic repercussions on their national uh, country. So there, you, you are not confident that you get unity. We are hopeful. For example, uh, now, uh, very shortly, uh, two very important uh, uh, policies are going to be adopted. For example, on immigration. We know very well that back in 2015, when the immigration policy at that time was suggested, well, you know what? Uh, Germany, of course, and other countries, Sweden included, they opened uh, and they welcomed uh, refugees and immigrants. And Hungary and Poland were dead against it. So let's hope that this time, when next week, next week, the immigration, the new immigration policy is adopted. And after what happened in the island of Lesbos, which was terrible, you know, even to, to look at it, you can imagine uh, 12,000 people in that area, you know, running again from fire. You know, I hope it will make them realize that if they were, if they want to remain in the European Union and they want to be Europeans, they must abide by the rules of Europe. And we cannot forget about the rule of law. We cannot forget about democracy. We cannot forget about human rights. And we have to open our boards to those who are qualified. And I think we have to welcome them and make them part of our community. It pays, I think, not only to them, but to us to welcome them and make them integrate into our communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, Michal. Um, I'm just the Andrula Vera. I'm very happy that Andrula brought up the, um, the fire and uh, this, this just uh, horrible, um, destruction of, of the camp now and uh, because of course the the um, what I'm seeing is that Greece wants Turkey to take in the, <laughs> the refugees uh, and it's precisely this I think um, this level of right of human of uh, these ideas of, of that the EU uh, wants would like to espouse um, that is optimistic ones that uh, uh, Johan was talking about that uh, we need to see more um, how they um, you know, translate into uh, how they affect uh, people. So it's uh, one thing to talk about uh, right, incorporating like Muslims and other Roma Jews, and but actually in how the uh, EU and the, the, the national members of the EU are going to act on that. Um, and then uh, so, and I thought about that precisely in terms of um, again the sort of uh, sort of state level and then sort of the practices that kind of a discrepancy that uh, sometimes they, they meet and sometimes they don't um, but it also made me think a little bit about something else I wanted to bring up that I've been thinking about a little bit is that how um, that I think it's something that, that seems important to me is that um, that you have uh, these sort of uh, kind of vertical and sort of horizontal kind of uh, relationships and alliances and what we see that what um, I think is often missing and or needs to be sort of uh, sort of fortified are these horizontal alliances between groups uh, that are uh, in these more precarious positions uh, within the EU uh, so that these initiatives from the top that are, are very important uh, have to be informed not just by um, have to be informed by these conversations. And as someone who's a historian, and I look a lot of sort of, a, let's say, if I think about Jews and Muslims and their place in Europe, 
uh, and particularly since we are seeing that Europe's identity, the sort of question of European identity uh, is still, uh, it's there even the word that, that the Christianity of Europe is something that has not disappeared, in, either there in the symbols that we're seeing, or uh, even in this attempt to uh, add uh, the Christian identity of Europe to the constitution of Europe by some of the politicians like uh, Jose Maria Asnar uh, and others. Uh, which um, uh, so I think that uh, I think that the um, something that I'm that the horizontal relations, for instance, with Jews and Muslims in particular, I see that something that's happening and it's very cynical and it has a historical resonance uh, that has a historical resonance that uh, the um, that often it's now it's the right wing really these sort of far right groups that are, are trying to sort of drive a wedge between Jews and Muslims and uh, you can think of the alternative for Germany party which caters to to Jews uh, and yet is, is anti-semitic at the same time by um, having these platforms that are anti-immigrant and um, and that really echo echoes uh, so I, I think again, uh, so that's not necessarily the state level because uh, luckily, <laughs> at least in, the, in power, uh, the alternative for Germany party, but it's, um, but I think it's, there's a general phenomenon of having these top down kind of uh, processes of, you know, heritage and incorporating them without sort of consultation. And I could talk about the citizenship law in Spain, Portugal, in Spain in particular is an example of that. Uh, and I just want to add that um, just the historical resonance for me was very interesting to think of uh, these far right uh, parties, for instance, reaching out to the Jewish communities, telling them you should be afraid of, of anti-Semitism from Muslims, you should uh, you know, be anti-immigrant, uh, while uh, in colonial context, whether it's in French Algeria or in the Spanish protectorate, for instance, uh, in the Reef in northern Morocco, it's precisely what um, the colonial uh, sort of authorities would do uh, let's say for the Camus decree in 1870 in Algeria by uh, giving Spanish uh, French citizenship to Jews uh, before uh, they give them to, to, to any Arabs uh, as an example or um, and putting these groups against each other so for me it's something I, I am interested in seeing the building of these horizontal relations uh, between these groups and that informing these processes so then my, the last point I'll make uh, is that for instance with the Spanish uh, law that is looking at 1492 in which you had Muslims expelled as well. And there's no offer, a uh, parallel offer to the descendants of Muslims to re repatriate to Spain and become citizens. So of course that's going to create new tensions. So. Thank you. No, I think this is so interesting to think about sort of the nat national citizenship laws and how this, um, fits into this, you know, again, this kind of meta, we keep coming back to this motto of united in diversity, right, which, you know, I think, what I think keeps coming, you know, we kind of keep circling back to this idea, which is this ideal that Europe, that the EU and the European project wants, right, but that what's, it's often being challenged by what's happening at the nation state level, especially, and we're seeing that in terms of, from a citizenship perspective, right, who is a citizen, who isn't, I think this, the law that Michal has mentioned a couple of times that, that is relevant to Jews, but not to Muslims, right, I think is a case in point. I think that that is, you know, a, a country trying to, you know, through its citizenship law, really making a statement of who is and who isn't, eligible for Spanish citizenship, who is or who isn't then, you know, part of this, you know, the Spanish nation, but then that also then tracks up towards the, to the EU, that if those, if Spain is not recognizing those individuals as citizens, then how does that then fit into the larger idea from, from the European Union, that everyone is united in diversity, but then at the same time, the state itself, the nation state is making a very clear statement of who is and who isn't. So I think that that really points to it to again this kind of maybe this this challenge that we're seeing between from the, the top and and the bottom per se. Susanna, did you want to get in uh, get on, on into the conversation here? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, raise it because um, the idea of um, integration was mentioned, and I think this relates to what Mikhail was saying as well around the need um, for it not to be a one way process of integration where. Um, people who are migrating to or returning to um, Europe are expected to migrate into um, either into nation state societies or European society, but rather it should be um, a two way process of dynamic change and, um, you know, changing the European societies in ways that it has always changed and has always been dynamic and to continue that process 
um, rather than seeing um, there being a sort of a fixed European culture or a fixed European um, set of, I guess, a way of life, to go back to that phrase from earlier on, um, but to see it as something that is a dynamic evolving process which will always be changed by people who come, people who go, and the changes in, in people's ways of, of seeing themselves and looking at the world together. Um, so I just wanted to raise that point about integration being um, more than just um, expecting newcomers to change, to adapt to, to the society they come to, but something about society changing as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, act, and, and uh, we actually have a, a question uh, from an, uh, an audience member that, that, that gets to that. Um, and I'll, I'll read the question and then, uh, uh, Susanna, if you'd like to respond or if anyone else would, that would be, that would be great. Uh, so the question is, what is the best way to address the challenge of assimilation of migrants without losing the diversity of cultures, which also includes preserving the culture of European countries? So a bit of this tension that, that it, perhaps you, meant, you just mentioned, which is um, integrating the new without losing the old, let's say. Um, so I don't, Susanna, if you want to perhaps respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that I, that I or anybody else would have any, any um, authority to decide what the best way would be, because there are so many multiple different ways. And mm -hmm. everybody, you know, of course, we will all, whether in this discussion or elsewhere across Europe, we will disagree amongst ourselves as to which is the best or the better or, or somewhere near, you know, something acceptable. But um, I suppose my key, my key point would be that um, also that it isn't about um, expecting the new to assimilate without losing the old, but expecting the old to change as well, because that is just, that is, you know, human development. That is the way in which cultures have developed and changed. Um, and I suppose my way from, a, you know, coming from a heritage studies perspective um, of this, I would see um, the need to take, um, again, I think as Michael was saying, a more of a, a, a grassroots approach to understanding what it is that's important to people, um, whether it's about their past, their heritage, whether it's about where they are now, what they're doing now, the places they're in, the, the experiences they have, or whether it's about a way of imagining a future and a collective future um, that may be different to the past and different to what is happening now. And to see that as a way of um, thinking about heritage as being something that can be changed and adapted through um, ongoing processes that people are involved in. Um, and through this kind of, um, not assimilation, but through contact between different ways of doing things, different experiences, Again, it's a, it's a little bit like the translation. So it's not that we translate one language from another within this idea, but that we all learn together to, to find a way to understand each other and to, to take on board different aspects of each other's ways of doing things to develop something new, potentially collective or multiple different ways of doing something going forward. Um, and to see that as a process of heritage development um, rather than this kind of fixed um, top-down idea of this is what culture and heritage are for Europe and this is what's important and therefore if you're new to this uh, this society you should learn that this is what is important but rather what can this society learn from you about what's important to you that we add to our collective understanding of a European heritage um, that is relevant for the future as well as um, for now and in relation to the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Andrula? Yes, if I may uh say a few things that I think are important uh, in this respect. First of all, it's a question of the language uh, because it is important, first of all, to learn the language of the host country in order to be able to uh, get into the society. But it is also important to support maintaining their own language. It is important for their memory, for their identity, and so on and so forth. So language are very important. Second is education and uh, providing skills to them in order to be able to have an employment and have a, a more prosperous life. Because most of them, I think, they come for uh, two reasons, for a safer life and for a more prosperous life. So I think by giving them skills and education, you. Uh, you really give them what they need in order to find employment. But also regarding their culture, 
For example, I remember when we were organizing the cultural capitals of Europe, the European uh, cultural capitals, it was very important to include in the various activities that they were organized during the year of the capital, to include the minority groups or the refugees and the immigrants in order to give a taste of what they represent of their own culture. So it is important that you give them this chance to participate and feel part of the community and of the society. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Micha? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add to um, Susanna and Andrulo that I think, again, that the, um, that the, so there, there are so many uh, parts of life in which con contact, I think uh, Susanna mentioned contact, uh, that, are, that are just not, not really happening. Uh, and that, uh, and there's, sort of, there's sort of a danger at um, making um, sort of, you know, uh, laws about, I mean, that's legislating, uh, if it's, you know, re let's say remembrance, let's say Holocaust remembrance, for instance, or without actually um, in a way that, again, is not, uh, is too much from the top down. And we're seeing it in some places where there's actually been, I think, some of the reactions um, to that kind of legislation uh, and resistance to it is, is, is very, is disturbing. Uh, but also, uh, if we talk about uh, an, edu in an education too, and there's an interesting case, it just reminded me that there was an interesting case about, and this is, there was a question I think that I see about hybridization, whether it's desirable. And there's an interesting, was an interesting case in France I think this was in this was uh, quite some time ago, but about the curriculum, and I'm sure it's you know less, less in France. But what happens then? Um, on the one that we have to, um, we want to move away from this idea of the, you know Christians of uh, Europe, Christian heritage, and this is uh, that we want to um, basically bring in uh, other right kinds of heritage, the Muslim heritage of, of parts of Europe uh, for. Um, Right, parts that were part of the Ottoman Empire or uh, the Iberian Peninsula, our uh, Jewish heritage, uh, the Jews have been there you know, again for, in Europe for, um, uh, for you know, thousands of years. But um, what happens in a, in a curriculum, in an education, I'm not a you know, policymaker at all, but I think this was a very interesting case in France where they talked about whether incorporating um, some history about, let's say, the history of the Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula, would that help uh, sort of uh, or immigrant, uh, Muslim immigrants sort of feel kind of more integrated into French culture. Of course, you have Algeria, the, the question of Algeria. Uh, so how do you incorporate uh, parts without actually, that are actually pertinent to, uh, there was a lot of sort of debate about that, whether uh, is it sort of imposing something that is uh, sort of artificial uh, and not necessarily uh, you're just telling this person who might be from um, let's say, uh, whose family had no connection to the Iberian Peninsula and to the history of Al-Andalus uh, to kind of learn this history and make it theirs. But if we're talking about a supernatural Europe, that's part of a European experience. And again, I don't remember the exact details of that debate, but it was about how do you incorporate uh, these parts into the education curriculum that, are, that I thought were, um, were interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. and how do you do that in a way that is, uh, that it becomes part of the curriculum and it's not just imposed again in a way that doesn't resonate uh, even with people who you want to try to incorporate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to um, uh, get into something that I think is, is, is particularly re relevant for those of us in the U.S. and how to, how to um, uh, how, the, how the difference between Europe and the U.S. In, in, some, in some sense. And so what I'm referring to specifically is the year of cultural heritage um, that uh, the EU, uh, um, that was the, the EU's year of in 2018. Um, and this was uh, instituted, right, as, and part of the goal with that was to overcome some of these challenges, right, that we've been talking about to reinforce a sense of belonging to a common space in Europe, etc. And I know in the U.S. and in our center in particular, we sort of uh, wrestled with this a bit because we couldn't really celebrate European heritage at a time when white supremacists had taken on this narrative in the U.S., right? This was at the moment of, of what was happening in Charlottesville and Virginia, for example, and elsewhere. 
Um, but this was something that the EU was able to do proudly and without sort of the same stigma. And I wonder if we could talk a bit about why this is and why Europe was able to do this um, in ways that we really feel, you know, personally, I know, as I said, in our center felt uncomfortable doing and more generally the challenge of doing that in the US. Um, so whoever would like to, to, to take that, um, take that question. Um, Andrula, go ahead. Well, um, first of all, let us uh, remind ourselves that uh, it is specifically provided in the EU treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, which, is, which came into force in 2010. That is uh, Article 3.3. .3. It says that the, uh, that, the United, that the Union shall respect the rich cultural and linguistic diversity and shall ensure that Europe's cultural heritage is safeguarded and enhanced. So in order to promote this article, it was important to devote the whole year. And I must say that we didn't have a European year for some time because uh, you know, we avoided that uh, for different reasons. But this was thought that was important because you remember after the economic crisis, we had all these groups of the populist groups, the nationalistic groups, the ultra-right, the ultra-left, who, who promoted division of Europe instead of bringing Europe together. So it was very important to bring to the fore things which united us. And it was thought, quite rightly, that culture and cultural heritage was a uniting force. And I remember that, the, of course, in every country uh, we celebrated with a lot of events, but I can mention two very, very important events which uh, gathered thousands of people. That was, the first one was the Berlin Cultural Heritage Conference Summit, which was in June 2018, and which brought policymakers from the European, national, regional, local uh, level, but also uh, hundreds of people who were involved in culture and cultural heritage. And um, uh, I think this created a, you know, a sense of belonging. And the same was repeated the year after, after the, uh, the uh, cultural year of the cultural heritage, and that was the Paris summit in October 2019, in which uh, the uh, Paris, um, the Paris uh, um, uh, um, accord was uh, adopted, and uh, the Paris manifesto, and in which they specifically asked the European policymakers to adopt to pay special attention to cultural heritage because from their experience of the whole year of cultural heritage, it was proven that this was a uniting force. And I must say that the, the, uh, the um, European leaders in the European Council uh, of uh, 2019, in June uh, 2019, I think it was in uh, Sweden, uh, Johan, that uh, uh, European Council, they adopted the new strategy, a strategic agenda for the EU for the years 2019 to 2014. And it was specifically provided there that culture and cultural heritage, which are at the heart of our European identity, have to be supported and promoted, and we have to invest in that. So it was very important because it created a momentum, I think, for this field to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. Susanna, do you want to jump in here? Thank you. I mean, I think that's really interesting. I mean, it, I had two, one kind of comment and one almost question back from, a, from, a, from my own perspective, not knowing perhaps enough about the US perspective. Um, is what is it that makes European um, heritage somehow white to, a U to the US public or a US audience? Because I'm not, you know, although we have criticized the, the idea of, of heritage, European heritage as being, you know, diverse or not diverse enough, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that celebrating 
um, cultural heritage in Europe is about whiteness per se, or about that kind of activity, unless the political activity behind it is has that agenda. So, um, I wondered whether that was a sort of an open question in a way. But I also just wanted to add um, from my own experience of um, being involved in some activities that were part of the European Year of Cultural Heritage. Um, and I also wanted to say it's interesting that in English, the terminology is the European Year of Cultural Heritage and not the Year of European Cultural Heritage, because there's a real distinction there um, around what that would include or might not include. Mm -hmm. It's interesting from a UK perspective that um, I was involved in a, um, a Horizon 2020 research project all about European identities um, during that time, the Cohere project. Um, and um, we discovered that there were no activities in the UK connected to the European Year of Cultural Heritage because activities, people could um, plan an activity and then register it on the website and become part of the year. Um, without receiving any additional funding or any other kind of um, support. It was a, you know, it was a, in a way it was intended, I think, to be a, a way to encourage grassroots activity. But so as a project, as a research project, we um, found and encouraged some activities to go ahead within the UK, um, one of which was around ringing bells around different places in Europe. Um, and uh, one of our colleagues on the project did uh, made a film of bells ringing around Europe, which can, you know, as part of that. Um, so the only, as far as we understand it, the only UK activity for the European Year of Cultural Heritage was a solo bell ringer ringing um, the bell of a tiny little, um, very old church in the Northumberland, um, you know, in the Northumberland countryside in the northeast of England to an audience of four or five sheep and one filmmaker. <laughs> um, which is, you know says something in itself perhaps about the UK uh, connection to the UK <laughs> attitudes around Europe and European heritage uh, and how you know as we see that playing out politically in different ways right now um, but I suppose I was just you know bringing it back to the idea of if there is a year of, of cultural heritage that is promoted by Europe does that make it somehow an essential um, essentialized issue of essentialized European cultures or, or European heritages or, or should it be as much about diversity um, as some of the points we've raised already um, and I, I do wonder whether perhaps um, even within the European perspectives and the different European responses to this initiative whether um, there could have been a stronger um, steer in the guidance towards what counts as cultural heritage for this European year, you know, could it, could it involve, you know, connections to heritage that connect beyond Europe? And of course, it, in my perspective, it should, because European heritage and European culture is always and has always been created in, in collaboration and in, influenced by and developed through connections beyond Europe and beyond um, the geographic um, boundaries of Europe, in addition to the political boundaries of Europe. And so, you know, where do we where do we draw the line around what could be part of a European year of cultural heritage and what what should not? Um, which also reminded me of the question around European values and how how and why are these values European when actually maybe they're they're global values or human rights values in this, at, at the same time. Um, so I'm afraid I've just added more questions rather than. <laughs> No, I, thank you. And I think, um, you know, I think this points to kind of in some ways, uh, many of the things that we were thinking about uh, within the center when we uh, decided to have our focus this year about sort of creating Europe and many of these topics will continue. This is a little sort of promotion of what we're <laughs> doing uh, throughout the year, but really sort of engaging with many of the things that, that, we, that we've all, you've all raised today, which is why this was such a great uh, kickoff to this, which is, you know, these larger questions of, you know, what, what is Europe? What, how do we define what is European what, in, from a cultural perspective, from a linguistic perspective, from a religious perspective, and who makes those decisions? Um, and we have a whole uh, series in the in which we're looking at sort of creating Europe through 
uh, and one event lo is looking at architecture and one is looking at language um, and, uh, uh, and crisis actually is, is another since we're in the middle of one. So we thought we should think about that as well. Um, so, you know, uh, I appreciate all of the questions that, uh, that Susanna, that you've raised and others as well, because of course we won't have the time today to, 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 to touch on all of these, but that this is part of the continuing conversation. Um, and I see my colleague just put uh, the um, schedule in the chat for any of those that, that are listening. Um, before I get to Johan, who I know has been wanting to, to jump in, um, we are getting towards the end of our time. So if you do have a question, uh, please do put it in the chat and I will, we will try and, and try and get to that um, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Johan. Yeah, I must confess that I, I don't remember that I participated or noticed the year of European oh. cultural heritage um, in Sweden where I live. Uh, of, I'm sure there were activities, it's maybe my ignorance, but um, I think generally it's of course interesting with cultural heritage, but it's important maybe not, I, I think maybe with the words of Paul Gilroy once said, uh, discussing Af North Atlantic exchanges between Europe and America and Af Africa, that it's more important to talk about roots uh, trajectories than to talk about roots, <laughs> uh, origins. Um, so instead of discussing essences of what is European basically or from the origin, we should say maybe what happened in, in the European context, what, which kind of crossroads have developed between different cultures within the European space and in the European context. Uh, and there, the idea of what is European identity is continuously reconstructed and I don't think we will it would be useless to think of that it's some essence that we should reconstruct or find symbols for or anything like that. It's more, where do we stand today and, and what are our tasks today as living in Europe? Uh, also, I saw the question that someone sent in about hybridization. Is it, a, is it a, what was it? Is it a desirable goal? I, I, I wonder, I wonder about that. I have a positive view on hybridization, but it's not as a goal. I think it's more a fact in a way. I mean, I think that cultures always are, also national cultures are always mixtures and they are always, um, if they are creative and not, uh, not haven't uh, stabilized into f dead <laughs> uh, artifacts, they if they are living cultures, they are always mixtures in some ways. It's always in the margins between cultures that new things come up, that creative impulses appear. And in that sense, that's why I am positive to this project because I think it, it makes us, it, it gives us useful competencies for dealing with a changing world that we are living in today. And, um, but I don't think it needs to be a goal. It's more like it, it's something we cannot escape from hybridization because that's the world we live in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to, um, since we are running a, a bit short on time, um, I, I want to uh, give everyone sort of a, a chance to, to have some closing comments and perhaps get to anything that we did not get to, um, which were many things, because um, this is such a rich, rich, rich topic. I just wanted to, to respond briefly, Susanna, to your to your comment, to your comment, to my comment, or my question about, uh, about the U.S. And I think, um, and of course, this could be a very long discussion, but um, um, I think briefly, I think some of it is perception, right? And this kind of is something that I think we've all been sort of circling around um, is the reality versus the perception. And I think the challenge that we found here in trying to celebrate, you know, the year, the, the, this year of cultural heritage was how it was being perceived in the context of the U.S., right? So the perception is obviously very much tied to the context that we all know that one is in and that that is, although we know that that is not, we all know that that's not what Europe is. And we know that from our perspective in, in, in the center, what we really strive to do is to move beyond some of those maybe older perceptions of what European culture and heritage and all of those kinds of things are in our in our own programming and really try and bring in different perspectives and voices, etc. Um, our year of programming a couple of years years ago was global Europe and really very much um, uh, engaged with that. But I think the larger perception, uh, unfortunately, and as we've talked about, is being taken on by other groups to mean certain things. Um, and that just complicates things, I think. In, in all sorts of ways. Um, but I do want to give all of you a, a, a chance just to have some brief, brief comments before we conclude. So Michal, do you want to start? 
Sure. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I really, um, I really like what uh, Johan uh, commented on about this idea of roots, because I and uh, how it's very easy and historically we've seen that how uh, in searching for the the roots of Europe, uh, even when it's uh, been done in ways that include right populations that have been excluded, uh, there's often some kind of uh, essentialization, essentialization, uh, or kind of um, motive to try to reclaim uh, something in order to uh, for some kind of political strategy or different so I think there are a lot of dangers to that um, at the same time uh, right while we we think you know study it's important to look at these histories and how they've right been I use the word entangled and uh, have interacted uh, again is much more uh, effective because there is that danger of, of uh, searching for right these these roots. So I just wanted to say that I, I, I really agree and that I think that would that really applies to also how we go about um, right, how publics uh, get are becoming educated about these issues um, and so um, and I guess um, so that that was something that just struck me that I, I think again it's very easy to sort of essentialize uh, these um, uh, cultures and issues and, and I think that's precisely what some of the problems from these top-down kind of state level initiatives uh, are doing uh, rather than grassroots initiatives. So that, that just that. And then, um, and then I guess in terms of uh, just one more thing that in terms of lived experiences, I do think that there are um, certain, especially when it comes to religion, because uh, we can, you know, we talked a lot about cultural identity, even when I, when I mentioned Jews and Muslims, I, I, I really was talking more about sort of, uh, culture and, and I think when it comes to religion uh, and certain um, European, let's say, uh, we, we, we talked, the word values came up. Uh, and of course, that's also something that's fluctuating as we also mentioned uh, that uh, there are sort of uh, challenges in terms of public spaces that are shared and how those sort of real lived experiences, whether it's a locker room where uh, you have to worry about modesty suddenly when you never worried about that before, uh, so again, that's a whole nother discussion, but I think that, again, we um, can't essentialize, uh, right, uh, other cultures either, and we, at any culture, so in order to really kind of look at these, uh, of, of these personal, of these of contact. I think, that, I think that's really it, because I don't want to, I know there are other, other there are questions from the audience, so I don't want to say more. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Johan. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know I, so much more to say, but I think that uh, you, it's important that we acknowledge that Europe is diverse, not only that there are horizontally different cultures living side by side, but also there are different levels. There are central authorities, there are popular movements, there are um, uh, some also some positive, some negative things that we have done together, so to speak, philosophy, arts and enlightenment has been developed in Europe very much, but also colonialism and fascism. So we need to deal with those heritages also and not, uh, not be silent about of them. Um, uh, yeah, that's maybe all I... I could say that also that um, uh, maybe it's important to know, to remember that uh, even if Europe is diverse, so are all the national nations that uh, form Europe and it's sometimes uh, falsely understood that Swedishness or Germanness that that would be a, or Spanishness would be one homogeneous identity but that's definitely as you know not the case in fact several European countries are almost splitting up in different different countries so they are also barely holding together unity so we mm -hmm. cannot escape the problem with hybridization by go, stressing the national level it doesn't help at all it's, mm -hmm. it's as much division there mm -hmm. thank yeah. you thank you uh susanna speaking of countries breaking up uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank you um i guess i just wanted to kind of try and bring some of these different things together a little bit um and thinking about i've been thinking about the faro convention um which is very relevant to issues of cultural heritage and a small quotation from that talking about the fact that objects and places are not in themselves what is important about cultural heritage 
um, but in fact the meanings and uses that people attach to them and the values they represent is what's important in terms of cultural heritage but it's I also want to just add on to that in a you know in a more reflective kind of way to think about what Mikhail said about shared experiences and difference within Europe um, I think it's very important particularly in the political sphere um, for it to be understood and recognized that well across Europe within Europe um, between Europe's so we may well have shared experiences but the at the same time those will those will be very different experiences from different different points of view and different perceptions um, and that that needs to be I think perhaps more recognized at times within the political um, framing of Europe and within some of the policy instruments relating to issues of identity and heritage um, and that that could be this idea of um, openness to recognizing difference could be increased a little more um, in order to help things to move forward in a in a constructive um, way for the future of Europe. Thank you. Andrula. Yes, um, you started by mentioning the founders of the, of the Union and uh, what uh, Robert Schumann said about how the Union is going to develop step by step. And I think every challenge and every difficulty uh, makes, uh, makes us rethink about it and out of the crisis, we come, I think, a little bit stronger. Uh, recently, for example, we had too many crises. We had the economic and financial crisis, which lasted for several years. We had Brexit. And I remember uh, everybody was saying that after Brexit, there will be uh, other, uh, other <laughs> nations following. This didn't happen because it made the rest of the Europeans, you know, uh, feel the necessity to keep together. And now, of course, uh, probably we could extend this motto, unity in diversity, and say also in adversity, because we went through this very, very serious, and we are still going through this very serious crisis of the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic. And um, unless we keep united and we add uh, each other to, uh, to the force of the, of, of the union in order to be able to help us, we could not cope. No country could cope on its own. So it's only by working together in adversity that we can get out of this problem and this uh, uh, crisis. So I think this proves also how correct is the motto of unity in diversity and in adversity, I would add. Well, thank you. I think that's a, a, that's a wonderful point to end on. And I want to thank each of you for a wonderful discussion. I know we touched on a lot of different things and, and could continue this conversation uh, for the rest of the afternoon or evening, which we will not. But um, I think, I think uh, it points to uh, all sorts of interesting, as, as I said, point, questions and debates and, and uh, points to continue that we will be uh, working through. Uh, over the next months in our in our in our programming. So I want to thank all of you for joining us and thank you to all of our uh, um, audience members as well. Um, the uh, recording of this will be available on our website um, as well as additional resources for further reading. Um, we will be noting some of the publications that our panelists have published themselves as well as other resources on this topic that may be of interest. Um, I also want to uh, draw uh, attention to uh, a survey that uh, my colleagues uh, are posting in the chat. Um, and this should just take a few minutes um, and, and is asking you just uh, some information about today's roundtable. Uh, you'll also receive a link to this as well. Um, and would really appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill out the survey. This will help us in future programming and also as uh, in our grant applications, um, um, which, are, which are ongoing. Um, so thank you again to everyone, and I uh, hope you have a good afternoon or evening wherever you are joining us from.